So good day, friends. This is Dr. Bob Hamilton, and you have tuned in today to the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you tuning into this podcast. It means a lot to me. So uh, if you like what you hear, s- write a nice little note and send it over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcast, and tell a friend that we appreciate that. We're building an audience, and it's appreciated that you you help us do that. So Today is a special day. We have a distinguished university professor of modern European history from the University of Maryland and College Park. He's an author. He's done some interesting, fascinating books. We're going to talk about those today. And his name is Dr. Jeffrey Herf. Dr. Jeffrey Herf, welcome to the Hamilton Review. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. It's a pleasure to be with you. Really is a pleasure to have you here, too. So, Dr. Herf uh, is, uh, has written a book that caught my eye. It was actually reviewed in the Wall Street Journal. The name of the book is called Israel's Moment. The subtitle is International Support for and Opposition to the Establishment of the Jewish State, 1945 to 1949. Uh, and we're going we're gonna, to, this is a, uh, an interesting book. I read the entire thing. I annotated it. And uh, it was a read. It was quite a read. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about that book. But before, uh, Dr. Herf, we get into um, this conversation about your book, um, this is the subtitle of my podcast is called Where Kids and Culture Collide. So um, I like to, you know, we don't have too many uni- uh, university history professors on this show. In fact, I think, Dr. Herf, you're the first one. So, oh my goodness! Congratulations on being the first. Um, but <laughs> we're, we're not also terrible. <laughs> but uh, if you would be kind enough, first of all, to tell us a little bit about your your story, your you know where you're from, where you grew up, a little bit about uh, your background, and and I'm very curious to know what was that passion, that that fire that stirred in your heart to go into history, to become a historian, and ultimately to become a doctor of, of history and uh, and a university professor. So I'll, I'll give the microphone to you. You can take it away, take it from there. Okay. Uh, I was born into a Jewish family in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1947. My mother's parents came from Ukraine before World War I, when they were escaping the anti-Semitic pogroms of the Russian Empire. And uh, the my father uh, uh, was able to get out of Nazi Germany in 1937, uh, uh, not not long before uh, Nazi policy radicalized uh, and became even more dangerous. Uh, my father then um, <clears throat> and met my mother in Milwaukee, and, and then my dad joined the United States Armed Forces and uh, 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 served in World War II. Uh, so all those events, Nazi Germany, the war, there was things I grew up with as a kid. Uh, and, uh, uh, that's the beginning of my interest in things in the past, uh, dealing with the past. Um, and, uh, you know, I had a Jewish religious education and, uh, I was, uh, enamored of the prophets, uh, um, and in the sixties was very engrossed in the civil rights movement. And, uh, I thought, uh, uh, but the, whereas other kids in grade school, you know, their dads, they would, they would talk about Iwo Jima or D-Day, whatever. I, I sometimes would, they would talk about things like Auschwitz and I would get blank stares. Um, so that was the beginning really. And then when I went to college, uh, I had some professors, uh, at the University of Wisconsin, who translated some of my sentiments into a more scholarly direction, and uh, the uh, uh, I was a young young man during the war in Vietnam and the, the tumult of those years, and and I also wanted to understand how all that happened. So uh, uh, eventually, uh, I returned to graduate school and decided that I wanted to be a historian and. Yeah. Uh, and write about uh, uh, how Nazism happened, uh, how it could come to power, why so many people were enthusiastic about it, uh, 
and was uh, always had a sense of that civilization had a very thin veneer and uh, democracy was something that needed to be protected and understood. So, you know, I could go on and on, but those are those are some yeah. of the key bi biographical dimensions. Um, no, I can see why you were, if you were surrounded with with parents, both of whom who had really escaped um, Europe, uh, Ukraine and, and Germany, of course, uh, though that would be something that would overshadow. And, and it sounds like your father, your father was how old when he got out of uh, Germany? Uh, 1909, 19, uh, 28. So he was 28. So he would have very vivid... Uh, vivid memories of Germany and what was going on in Germany, uh, the Wormir uh, period where Germany was in, you know, such hyperinflation and everything. And the, actually the rise of, of, of Nazism would have been very clear. Did he leave Germany because of the, uh, the Nazi uh, rise? Was that, was that the state? Oh, absolutely. Yes. I mean, uh, my, my dad was, was not a very political man, but he was an intelligent man. And uh, the, uh, the Herf family, uh, his brother, uh, my aunt, uh, came from a small town in the Rhineland, uh, south of the city of Mainz, and uh, there was a, a an uncle who had come to Wisconsin in the 19th century and made a good living in the liquor business, and uh, so mother, her family were among, I think, about 220,000 <clears throat> uh, German Jews who were lucky enough to come to this country at a time when most other Jews trying to get out of Europe were unable to do so. Yeah, my my dad never thought of himself as a uh, a survivor of the Holocaust. He had got out before the worst, but he did always regard himself as a very lucky man, and uh, and felt very indebted to the United States for saving his life. Uh, indeed, and and that uh, and close, uh, he got it in thirty seven. If in thirty seven, thirty eight, thirty nine, that door closed pretty pretty quickly, and uh, certainly during the war years, it became almost shut completely because it was impossible for Jews to get out of Germany um, in in Europe in general. The P PBS three part series on the U.S. and the Holocaust, which was just broadcast this week, is very uh, this week being mid September, uh, is very good. So your listeners to this podcast who want to spend three nights uh, on the United States and the Holocaust would be well served, in my opinion, uh, okay. to, to, to view that series. That's a PBS series? Yeah. Okay, beautiful. Thank you for that. Colle yeah. Colleagues of mine are among the historians who uh, uh, contribute to it. And it, it's, a, it's a fair and balanced, to use a, to use a cliched expression by now, uh, uh, it, it, it's, um, I, I think it expresses, uh, the scholarship about very controversial events quite well. Yeah. So, uh, professor, you are, uh, so you're a college professor. Um, my show, the, the listeners to my show are mainly young moms and dads who have younger huh? children, but, um, and I, I'm very keen on this idea of, of history because I think the history, and certainly as we begin to think back, I mean, as as a a, a person who's beginning to uh, get older, a little bit older, I think back about my story and the stories of other people, and I think history is a very critical thing to share with our children. Um, tell us your thoughts about why. Why is it, uh, this is my thinking, but do, do you have those sentiments and why is history important to kids? And why, why should we teach history? We should teach history because um, uh, the it's impoverished just to live in the present. Uh, and uh, uh, the, um, well, variety of reasons. One, it's important uh, to understand some of our best tradition. Um, it's uh, liberal democracy is a fairly young phenomenon in human history. How did that come about? Uh, a liberal democracy requires an understanding of the truth about the past. Uh, one of the things that post-war Germany, post-war West Germany, contributed uh, at its best 
uh, was the idea that in order for a liberal democracy to thrive, it has to be willing to look at uh, the dark sides of its history, of its past. And uh, uh, that the, the ability to look at past injustices and uh, uh, is not a source of weakness, uh, it's a source of strength and, uh, and a pride. And rather than national humiliation, it, it's an enrichment. And uh, not that one wallows in it or only focuses on that, but um, I think the uh, uh, looking at both the accomplishments and the shortcomings of of, one, of, of, of our past is uh, is essential. What a, a liberal democracy distinguishes itself from other forms of from any forms of dictatorship by its capacity to learn and uh, to learn as a result of conversation and discussion rather than at the point of a gun. So um, that that's one of its in, most important uh, virtues. And uh, um, the modern discipline of history is a product of the democratic revolution because you've just read a, a, a dense uh, a book that I've written with lots and lots of footnotes. And that book, is a product of the democratic revolution because uh, every single statement in that book uh, rests on uh, documents which if you had an enormous amount of time and patience and the ability to travel to the various archives you could see for yourself if what i'm saying about various documents is in fact the case so uh the modern discipline of history is an inherently anti-authoritarian in the best sense of the term phenomena we historians in the academy do not expect people to believe what we have to say because i'm a distinguished university professor and i have these various titles and the fancy public publishers publish my books though of course you know it would be naive to to think that this of course those things are important but uh the um uh the modern discipline of history uh, rests on the notion that we present the evidence and the reader that's why a footnote is so important for the democratic revolution a footnote is not just some pompous you know idiotic thing that's supposed to intimidate everybody the footnote is there because it says to the reader yes professor jeffrey herf does in fact know what he's talking about but uh if you wanted to look and see if what this guy herf is saying about the earth being round is really true, then you should go to the archive and look at where he uh, cites this particular document. And lo and behold, if the guy is telling the truth, the document is going to say what he says it says. And so that's a product of democratic revolution, as opposed to saying you should agree with what Herf says because Herf is such a genius and he has a job at the University of Maryland College Park and he's a distinguished university professor. So, uh, uh, the so I, uh, I I will tell you after reading. Listen, uh, friends, I, I did just finish reading this book, and the book he's referring to is Israel's Moment. This is a highly annotated book, and I think that what you're what you're saying is you need to have that buttressing, that buttressing of truth. I mean, when you make a comment, that comment is not just an opinion. In fact, I will, I will to your credit, uh, Dr. Herf, this book is written pretty apolitically. I, I was, I read books pretty carefully and your mm -hmm. book is written just like you would write a newspaper story. It is written without bias. It is written with in, intense, um, backup on everything, everything that is said. Most of it is quoting you quote a lot of your sources are just simple, simply pure quotes that you are not taking out of context. You you put them in context, and they're long quotes, and they are uh, they're they're that does kind of give credibility to what you write. And so there's probably a reason why you're a distinguished professor because you have made it made it your business to speak truth. Yeah, one of my colleagues, Richard Evans, uh, now is a emeritus at the University of Cambridge in in Britain, and uh, Richard wrote a book, a fine book, a short book um, called In Defense of History. Uh, about 15 years ago, and uh, uh, the um, and Richard said, you know, well, one of the things that a historian needs to understand is the value of understatement. Uh, fewer adverbs, you know, fewer superlatives, less hyperbole, 
being able, this is not a profession for narcissists. Uh, if your favorite noun is always I, and you want to be talking about yourself all the time, don't become a historian. You know? yeah. If you're willing to like try to recapture uh, what was going on in the past, if you want to really recapture the past as a foreign country, then history is a noble, uh, is a profession for you. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I agree with Richard. And uh, so I, I so I, I do. You're right. I mean, thank you for for those comments. I appreciate them a great deal. Um, uh, uh, the, you know, it's really gratifying when 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 a reader really understands what you're trying to do. And uh, uh, that gets at the point I made about history being an anti-authoritarian phenomenon. I don't you don't convince people by yelling at them or beating them over the head or uh, you know, getting them to yell and scream. That that's, you know, no. Yeah, uh, no. That that that's culturally, <laughs> you know, that's that's where you you convince the uh, the fans that your team is a better team, because you cheerlead them. But you're you're completely correct. I mean, this has to be somewhat unimpassioned, uh, you know, just kind of relating information and relating facts and relating truth and and showing a timeline which is actually verifiable. And the truth. So, uh, and you did a great job in this book. So, so going back to my original question before we we uh, break for a moment, kids need to hear history because. Finish that statement, Doctor Herf. Kids need to hear history because they can't understand the world that they're in at the moment if they don't know where it came from, and uh, uh, they have no idea whatsoever uh, as to why. Uh, we have elections instead of, instead of a civil war, uh, or uh, why there's freedom of speech instead of, uh, you know, uh, government control of everything that anybody can say. Uh, the, uh, they would have no idea why, why we think that human beings are equal to one another, uh, and that one race is not superior to, to another. I mean, the, there's, there's just no way in which they can understand anything about their world at the present if they don't have some understanding of the past. It's true. For better and for worse. Yep. So you you were raised with a with the Jewish uh, Jewish traditions, and one of the things that is said, I think, in Deuteronomy, is the idea that you should teach your children when you get up, when you walk along the way, every when you go when you go lie down about what happened, and and the, I think even the Passover, some of these uh, these holidays that. Uh, uh, Jewish culture remembers it, it really is, just a, it is simply a recitation of the story of the Exodus, the story of Purim, for of, of uh, you know of a Queen uh, Esther and these other stories. And this is kind of almost in your DNA, per, Professor. Well, I think it's in the DNA of of, of Western civilization at its best. Uh, the New York Times, Roger Cohn wrote a very moving article a couple of days ago about essentially contrasting the funeral of the queen implicitly with these graves in Russia where bodies were just thrown in them. And it was, it was making, I suppose, the point you were making about memory and the importance of, of the dignity of every human being and, and uh, uh, that, that you know, the importance of remembering that value of every human being, every life um, is, uh, I, Yes, I mean it's there in Deuteronomy, and and, and it, uh, uh, of course, after the Holocaust, uh, the duty to remember uh, is is powerful. Uh, but I think that that's that's generally um, not just a Jewish tradition, but but yes, I mean I, I grew up with that as well. No, yeah, no, this is hopefully more a part of the Western tradition as well. Okay, well, listen, uh, Professor, we're going to take a one minute break here. Uh, friends, you're listening to the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. We're going to come back and continue our conversation with Professor Jeffrey Herf, a distinguished university professor of modern European history at the University of Maryland College Park campus. So don't go away. We'll be right back. The Hamilton Review podcast is brought to you by Hamilton Babies, nine kid-friendly products designed for the little loves in your life. Find them at hamiltonbabies.com or amazon.com. Also consider Dr. Hamilton's recently published book, Seven Secrets of the Newborn, available at Barnes & Noble, your local independent bookstore, and Amazon.com. 
So, friends, welcome back to the Hamilton Review. We're continuing our conversation today with Professor Jeffrey Herf, H-E-R-F is how you spell his last name. He's a distinguished university professor of modern European history at the University of Maryland at the College Park campus. He's the author of a a a relatively recently published book. I think it came out in 2021. Is that correct, uh, Professor? 2022. This year, uh, the book is entitled Israel's Moment. And um, I was drawn to this book. Uh, It was reviewed in the Wall Street Journal. And uh, Professor Herf, phenomenal. This, This was clearly... A, a long effort. This took you, uh, it had to have taken you years to complete this book. Uh, let me see. It uh, began in 2017 and uh, and then finished in 2020, something like that. Yeah. yeah 2020, 2021. <clears throat> so that, in my mind, is for four years of, of hard work and hard labor. And I can tell, listen, I'm the beneficiary. I got to read the book. It, it reads, it reads faster. It didn't take me four years to read it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It took me a couple, several days to read it, but it wasn't four years. And so I, I thank you for your scholarship and I thank you for what you did. So this book, uh, friends, is about something that I, that I didn't know about there in 1948, Israel became an, a nation, uh, David Ben-Gurion, the, became the president of the new of the new um, country. But uh, th- what preceded that moment on May 14th, 1948, I remember the date because it's my father's birthday, Professor. Uh, mm-hmm. He was exactly 30 years old on that day. Mm-hmm. But um, th- th- that, that uh, talking about history, there was a history behind that moment because there was great debate. There was great things going on. The uh, year or two before, in particular, the, the year before, 1947, uh, there was a lot of debate in the UN. And, and I, I'm not I'm not a professor of history. I know a little bit about the story of Israel, certainly. But can we just kind of talk a little bit about, and by the way, can I just say parenthetically, listeners, uh, friends out there, this is not a subject we usually talk about um in this show, uh, the my subtitle is "Where Kids and Culture Collide." I think it's important to. We talked about history. Uh, this is. Uh, I will. I will tell you. I'm indulging myself. I do have a particular uh, interest in the history of modern Israel, and I'm fascinated by it. But I think we can back up a little bit, in, and I'll back up as far as the Balfour uh, Balfour uh, statement uh, that was made. Uh, the declaration they call it the Balfour Declaration of 1917. Can you kind of take it from there and just give us maybe a thumbnail sketch, a sketch of uh, the progression of the uh, the mandate, the British mandate of Palestine, and also some of the events that happened in the 30s and the 40s, and ultimately what led to uh, this historic vote of the UN in 1947? There's a large library about all of that, but uh, the Balfour Declaration was issued in 1917 by the British government in recognition of. Um, assistance to Britain uh, uh, offered by several prominent Jews within Britain and uh, made the argument that uh, uh, a homeland for the Jews should be established in British mandate Palestine. And uh, that was uh, in the 1920s and then 1930s, there was more Jewish emigration and uh, 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 there were some Arabs in mandate Palestine who welcomed uh, Jewish emigration to Palestine and who believed that Jews and Arabs could live together or a Jewish state in Palestine would be a benefit to the whole region. And, but uh, then there were other Arabs uh, 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 who eventually led by a man named Hajim and al-Husseini uh, who uh, uh, opposed Jewish immigration and opposed the Zionist project. And uh, conflict took place uh, in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, uh, the uh, Britain uh, in 1937, I believe, uh, um, uh, authored the Peel Commission report, which recommended a partition into a Jewish state and a, and a Palestine Arab state. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, then during World War II, the British government did 
what it could to prevent more Jewish immigration uh, to Palestine because the Arabs, they was Britain was a, was fearful of losing support uh, from the Arabs in the war against Nazi Germany. Uh, the um, after the war, uh, the uh, after the Holocaust, the uh, Jewish the pressures for Jewish immigration intensified as did uh, the opposition of, by Husseini and other members of the Arab Higher Committee, and uh, eventually Britain threw the issue into the United Nations with the full expectation that, uh, that the Jews in Palestine would not be able to gain uh, majority support for a partition into a Jewish and an Arab state. Surprisingly, in November of 1947, the partition resolution was passed in the United Nations with a two-thirds majority to establish a Jewish state and an Arab state in former British Mandate Palestine. That was November of 1947. The Jews in something called the Jewish Agency accepted the United Nations partition resolution. They accepted it. The leaders of the Arab Higher Committee uh, rejected it and rejected any Jewish state at all in former British Mandate Palestine, and instead uh, they just they began a war, a civil war, in December of 1947, uh, attacking the Jewish agency and the Jewish community in Palestine. And uh, in May of 19 May 15th of 1948. Uh, the five Arab governments uh, in the Arab League invaded the new state of Israel in order to wipe it out. And uh, the, um, the War of 1948 ended in Israel uh, surviving, uh, not being wiped out, uh, uh, surrounded by hostile Arab states that refused to recognize it, refused to make peace, or refused the partition resolution. Uh, the events, <clears throat> one could go on for a long time about these events, but you asked me to summarize. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, I th that's a start. Yeah. Okay. And, and that war ended in 1949. But the, the I guess, the, the, the British mandate, the British mandate was really a, a thing that happened after World War I, uh, correct? Where the, the Brits were essentially put in charge of the Palestine, what they call Palestine then. What did Palestine really, um, what piece of land in the Middle East did, did Palestine represent? Well, there were, era, the, the League of Nations, uh, you know, created, uh, the, the Ottoman Empire uh, had been defeated in World War One, And, the remnants of the Ottoman Empire were then divided up uh, into countries like Iraq and Syria. And the, I mean, they, these the, these these nations had existed, of course, you know, from time immemorial. But the 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 borders and the lines were then uh, set up by the by the uh, League of Nations, uh, which created Arab states uh, or codified their borders of Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Transjordan. Uh, and uh, uh, and the mandate Palestine, which is where Israel is now, uh, was was a, a governed by Britain, and the hope was that it would eventually evolve into these uh, the, these uh, either some kind of binational state or the, or, or two different states. Right. So, right. <clears throat> and so they, but it's, but the the Brits were. Uh, given a little bit of a headache because they had this immigration coming from Europe, mainly of European Jews who who had escaped the Holocaust, some of them, or survived the Holocaust, and uh, and not only the Holocaust but also just anti-Semitism in general, all through Ukraine, Russia, all all across Europe at that point, and they were they were clamoring to get into Israel. And um, one of the things that I, I find to be very interesting, which may not be known to a lot of people, is, is the British um, authored a thing called the White Papers. Can you tell us a little bit about the White Papers? Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, uh, engaged famously in a policy of appeasement uh, of Hitler 
in the hopes that a diplomatic solution over the Rhine, over the Czechoslovakia, uh, would appease Hitler and uh, uh, would um, uh, it would lead to peace. But Chamberlain was also a realist in some ways, and he understood that uh, that Hitler might go to war. And if he did so, uh, Chamberlain and the Foreign Office were very worried that the Arabs would support the Nazis. So uh, uh, the White Paper, which put very firm restrictions on Jewish immigration to Palestine during World War II and during the Holocaust, was an attempt to appease Arab sentiment uh, to, in, to indicate that, uh, that Britain uh, was uh, not sympathetic fundamentally uh, to uh, the Zionist project uh, and uh, and to convince the Arab states uh, not to ally uh, with uh, with Nazi Germany, which was not an idle threat because in 1941 uh, a, uh, a pro-Nazi government emerged in Iraq in uh, January, February 41 and Winston Churchill was so worried about about it that he sent the British military into Iraq uh in uh, i believe uh, may of 41 invaded iraq and overthrew uh, this uh this government that was sympathetic to nazi germany mm-hmm. so um uh, the white paper then was was an, it was an, an effort uh, to restrict jewish immigration in the hopes that it would uh lead uh convince the arabs that uh, that britain uh was not opposed to their interests yeah yeah, no, that that definitely put a crimp on the on the immigration, and actually did. In other words, British colonialism and British imperialism during the Second World War was pro Arab. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any question about it. And actually, when that vote came in in November 29th, I think of 1947, uh, Brit, the Brits uh, famously abstained from that vote, so they were not counted in that two thirds one third uh, vote uh, for partition of yes, or, right. of in uh, of of Israel. And the formation of Israel, um, I find the you know, Professor, there was one thing that I, I guess that I didn't realize, and that was we had the uh, the nascent the state of Israel had a friend in Harry Truman. He also, I think, Harry Truman had a very good friend who was Jewish. I, I don't can't remember his name. Eddie Jacobson. Yeah, there we go. Eddie Jacobson. So Eddie Jacobson basically had a personal plea to Truman to please mm-hmm. uh, let this happen. The interesting thing, and I didn't know this, was the State Department, which was then headed by Marshall. Uh, was it George Marshall? Yes. Yeah. Who was famous for the Marshall Plan. But uh, but George Marshall was very much opposed to the formation of the state of Israel, and as was the CIA and, and a lot of other members of the State Department. Can you can you share a little bit about the, those uh, those things? Well, Secretary of State George Marshall was also former five star general uh, George Marshall, um, and uh, next to Harry Truman was the most prominent person in American public life um, uh, during and uh, after World War Two. Uh, and uh, Marshall and Deputy Secretary of State Robert Lovett and Director of the Policy Planning Staff George Kennan uh, were preoccupied, as was President Truman, with uh, the shift from the anti-Hitler coalition of the coal of the World War II to a new alignment uh, focused on containing the Soviet Union and communism, and. Uh, the core of that policy was to prevent communist governments in Western Europe and, and in Japan as well. But the but the primary focus was on Europe, and uh, the uh, uh, everything else was secondary to that. Uh, th- these were the very first months of the Cold War, uh, and uh, Western Europe required for its economic recovery oil. And uh, oil was located in the Arab states. So that was uh, foremost on the minds of the Secretary of State, uh, the Pentagon, the CIA. Uh, They were very worried about an Arab boycott or Arab uh, losing Arab uh, resources. Uh, And secondly, they were very worried 
about Soviet advancement or Soviet penetration of the Middle East. And in the perspective of the State Department, the British Foreign Office, uh, the Jews were seen as, compared to the Arabs, modern people, people who knew something about socialism or Marxism or uh, who uh, were part of the modern left. And uh, whereas they viewed the Arab societies as very religiously conservative, uh, and they viewed uh, <laughs> Islam as a very culturally conservative uh, force that would prove resistance to communism. So in these very early months of the Cold War, the, uh, the Anglo-American national secu uh, security establishment did not worry that the Arab world would turn to the Soviet Union. But they were very concerned that the Zionists, that there would be some kind of connection between the Zionists and the communists. Sure. Uh, and the, these two things, the, 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 the question of oil and the question of communism, loomed over discussions yeah. in Washington and London. Well, I think, you know, to a degree, too, the, we, you know, you're talking about the kibbutz uh, programs and also the moshavs that are in Israel. These are collective, they were like collective farms. And they were thinking, obviously, the people in the State Department were thinking, okay, the uh, these immigrants to Palestine are going to set up a communist system, a communist way that would be more aligned to Russia. And so that was... Making, dis ma making fine distinctions between socialism and communism is... <laughs> Uh, one of those things that drive professors nuts when we try to uh, convince our students that there is such a distinction. Yeah. But uh, but the um, uh, the the Zionist the Zionist generation of Ben Gurion and, and Shertok and the others were they were Democrats with a small D, and uh, not they didn't want to have uh, they did not want to have a dictatorship uh, uh, in in Palestine. Sure. Uh, so it was yeah. All that was very clear, but it, but I, it was kind of hard to convince the State Department. And thank God Harry Truman said no. He he actually put it. He put his foot down and said no. You're going to vote. We're going to vote for it. And that was uh, th that was a pretty tight vote actually. <laughs> that came down to a couple of votes here and there, uh, one way or the other, could have made a big difference. So it was it, it, this uh, friends. This is an amazing read. It's a very amazing part of history. I do think that if. Uh, not to be political at this point, but if we actually put that vote to the UN today, I'm not sure you guys would get a get a state of Israel. Sorry, mm -hmm. I don't think you would. I think it'd be a kind of a. I think that would be not. Yeah. Uh, that wouldn't happen. So, anyway, a uh, very unique time in the history of the world. Very unique time, obviously, in the history of of the state of Israel as well. In when that foundation happened. So, interesting. Well, Professor Herf, our time has elapsed. You have been a wonderful guest. Uh, I want to thank you for taking your precious time for uh, coming on the Hamilton Review and sharing your thoughts about history and specifically about about your book, uh, The Israel's Moment. And, and friends, this book is available through Cambridge Press. Uh, Jeffrey Herf spells his name H-E-R-F, Jeffrey. Uh, the name of the book is Israel's Moment, and you can find it pretty much anywhere on Amazon, wherever you want to find a book. You can find this book, correct? Yes, it's on Amazon, and uh, the um, uh, it, it's easy. It's easy to find. It's easy to find. It's been a pleasure, really, talking with you. Uh, I've enjoyed this greatly, and uh, I really, really, you've asked made asked very good questions and made excellent points, and I, I, I I'm so appreciative. Uh, you know that, that to see your interest in history, and uh, uh, it is really important. Uh, you know that 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 young people um, don't live in an endless present. And, yeah. Uh, um, so. I, I like what you said on the first part of the show. Living in the in the present is you're living in poverty, and I and aim into that that thought. Well, friends, we're going to leave it there. Uh, Professor Herf, you have been a great guest. Thank you for being with us today on the Hamilton Review. And friends uh, listening, uh, thank you for joining in as well. And until next time, stay safe and stay encouraged. Take care. Bye-bye. You have been listening to the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your day. Tune in again next week on Apple Podcasts. Rate and comment and tell a friend.